Revelation 19, 1 through 10. Now we're getting ready to see the whole setting here about the second coming. But before we see the second coming, what's going to happen in Revelation 19 is we're going to see a heavenly scene. There's rejoicing in heaven for what's happened. We're at the end of the tribulation. Messiah is getting ready to come back. And they're going to praise God for his goodness because of all that has happened through the tribulation. The whore of Babylon is destroyed. The Antichrist is getting ready to get destroyed and the false prophet. And the whole system is crumbling down because of what God has done. And so now all of heaven is rejoicing. Here's the point and the principle we want to go with before we get into the text. The principle is this, is seeing the goodness of God. And you're like, well, I get that. But it's this. It's the capacity to see through the bad things that are happening to you to see the goodness of God. And that's hard for a lot of people to do. They can't see past the badness that's happening. And because the badness is right in front of them. Tomorrow morning, that badness will hit you. Whatever that badness is, or then maybe this afternoon, I don't know. It'll hit you, and you're looking straight at badness, whatever that is. And it's visible. It's tangible. And God's saying, you need to trust me. And, but he's invisible, and you don't see him, and you have to trust his word. It, it, it requires faith. And what God is saying is you're going to have to see past the badness to see the goodness that I'm providing through the badness. That's a very difficult concept for people to do because the devil, what he'll try to do to you is hope that you focus in on the badness and not get past it. And if you don't get past it, you will never see the goodness of God. In fact, what will happen inevitably is you will eventually blame God for allowing the badness in your life. And that will distance you from God and cause a separation, cause you not to want to be with him, cause you not to be as hungry as you should be for him, and keep you separated from him to a certain extent. Now, we're, all, we're talking about believers, but a distance can happen with believers if they continue to focus in on their badness. And what we're seeing in this passage is that God is saying, you need to see my goodness and look past the badness so you can see what I am doing for you and what I'm accomplishing through all of this. It's tough. This is a very difficult principle because it takes an incredible amount of faith. We'll unpack that in the application, but that's what we're going through here. And so what you want to see here is this. They're praising God for the goodness because they have actually went past the badness. That's what they're doing here in this text, okay? So let's see. This is right before the second coming. You're here in this text, by the way. This is you and I. We will be here. We will witness this. Verse 1. After these things, I heard a loud voice of a great multitude in heaven. That's you and I. We're going to be there with the angels and not the, even the tribulation saints that were martyred and the Old Testament saints. And everyone's there saying, hallelujah. Now, this is an interesting word. It's sometimes this word is taken for granted, but you need to understand the Hebraic understanding of this. Hallelujah is a two-word branched word to, that's been put together, been connected. And Hallel means God be praised or praise God. And Luya, the Yah in it, is a reference to Yahweh. So it's Hallel and Yah. Hallel, Yah. Praise Yahweh. That's the idea behind it. Now, I've mentioned this to you before in the uh, Lord's Supper, that during the Passover... At the end of the supper, they would have sang the Hallel Psalms. And that's Psalms 113 to 118, the Hallel Psalms, which are all praising Yahweh, but they're specifically in praise of God defeating the Egyptians in the Exodus. So the Hallel Psalms are Psalms referring to historically the Passover and the Exodus and God defeating enemies, but now they're being used in a future sense pointing forward that God will destroy our enemies and his enemies. That's where the, 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 the hallelujah comes from. The, the, basically, the basic meaning, when you say hallelujah, praise Yahweh, praise him for what? That he will destroy his and your enemies in the end. The enemies that are against you, the Babylonian system, 
of economics, politics, and the false religious system that is coming against you, the Hallel Psalms point to that destruction. And that's a good thing. That's the goodness of God that he wants them to see for you to say, hallelujah, hallelujah, that he's going to destroy your enemies, and that's the good he wants you to see. You know, it's interesting, just a side note, when I was in Catholic school, the nuns would not let us say hallelujah until we were around Easter. I never understood that. And boy, those nuns were as mean as a sack full of rattlesnakes, man. They were just... Oh, man, they were mean. It's just like they had, the, they, they had the bitters, and they were all bittered up, man. And I just remember that. And we would say, hallelujah, just to irritate them. You can't say that. And the reason they couldn't say it, because the Catholic Church had adopted, you could only say that during Passover or during Resurrection Week, which I understand why they would say that, because the Hallel Psalms are associated to the Passover. But then they just put this restriction on that, no, you kids don't say that. It was ridiculous. We say it under our breath all the time and just to get at them. But anyway, that's a side note. But it's appropriate for you to say because he will defeat your enemies. And I want you to think about all the junk that you're having to deal with right now. The enemies of bad health. The enemies of just ungodly people. All those enemies that you see in your life that are coming at you. Even your own sin nature. He's going to eradicate them. And that's a good thing. It's coming one day. And this is why they say salvation, or basically deliverance. Not just eternal salvation, but actually physical deliverance from all of this nonsense. Your body will be delivered, so it's a whole package of deliverance. And glory, and honor, and power belong to our God. Not the false gods out there, the false Jesus, the false Messiah of Antichrist. Our God, the one true God. And basically, he says, for true and righteous are his judgments. And, and what, is, what he has done is he's destroying the kingdom of the Antichrist. He's destroying Babylon. He's destroying the kingdoms of this world to usher in his kingdom. Okay, but the reason he says, for true and righteous are his judgments, the reason he says that is because some people, when they see God's judgment, doubt his goodness. They doubt his love, they doubt his grace, they doubt his mercy, and that's not what's happening. To be a good God, he has to punish evil. You cannot have this syrupy, sweet, grandfather-type God up there that will not take people to the woodshed. Eventually, humanity has to be taken to the woodshed. Eventually, they got to get their whipping. And in essence, they have to get their judgment. And so... He's saying, for true and righteous are him are, are his judgments because he, the time has come. It's enough. Enough is enough. Humans have destroyed this planet, and they will eventually prop up the Antichrist, start worshiping a guy, thinking he's God. Okay, time out. We're done. We're done. And we're going to judge it. And so he has given humanity plenty of grace, plenty of time, plenty of mercy. And we've talked about this in studying the book of Revelation. For goodness sake, he sends, a, he sends 144,000 all over planet Earth telling people how to be saved. He has the two witnesses doing miracles. He even has angels flying midair telling people the eternal gospel. What else does he have to do? They've seen the two witnesses resurrect. He's even let them see the demonic uh, activity that they're worshiping, see them in full force, and still they won't come to him. What else is left? Well, it's kind of like a parent at the playground and the kid won't stop misbehaving and hurting other kids and you say, all right, we're done. It's pick up your toys. It's time to come home. And in this case, it's more severe than that. There's hell to pay. But there's been plenty of mercy, plenty of grace given. So don't ever not include that when you see this. That's why he's saying true and righteous are your judgments. He's not doing this capriciously. He's not willing that any should perish, but all should come to repentance. Because he has judged the great harlot who corrupted the earth with her fornication. Remember, through money, through the political system, religious system, and the economics. And he has avenged on her the blood of his servants shed by her. And understand that it's not just simply for the tribulation. This goes back all the way to the Tower of Babel. When the Babylonian system came into effect, it created a false 
religious system. It created a false uh, political power system, and it created a false economic system. They have been with us ever since Nimrod, and now we're starting to see it ever more today. And and that system is, is affecting you. It's affecting me. It's affecting everybody on the planet. So he's saying, I'm going to crush it. And, and one of the hallmarks of her is she sheds blood. And in the tribulation, she kills millions of people because they will not march in line with her. So she's guilty of that. The system is. Verse 3. Again, they said, hallelujah. For her smoke rises up forever and ever. It's a perpetual reminder, a punishment. And I think I mentioned this to you before. There will be two spots in the kingdom age when we're there. One in Edom, one in Babylon. And in those places will be a perpetual smoke of fire and brimstone coming up from these places. Why? To rem- For you and I, as we walk by, to remember that's what he does to evil. That's how he destroys evil. And it's a perpetual reminder for us during the kingdom age. And it'll look like this. I mean, these are, I showed you these pictures before, but just imagine this molten lava pit right on these two locations where, it, where demons are confined here, constantly reminding us in the kingdom age, this is what he does to evil. This is what he does to evil. And by the way, this is a reminder to the mortals that make it into the kingdom. Because they will have babies, and they will produce babies and populate the earth. And guess what happens at the end of the millennium? They rebel against Jesus again. Even with these perpetual reminders, this is what happens to evil. They will still rebel against him at the end of the thousand years. It's quite shocking, isn't it? Nonetheless, let's go back to the text, verse 4. And the 24 elders, that's the church. I don't want to go into too much. I unpacked that when the 24 elders were first introduced in the book of Revelation. That's the church, okay? And the four living creatures fell down and worshiped God who sat on the throne saying, Amen, hallelujah. So just a a heavenly scene which we will be there. Amen. When you see this, and Jesus will say, Amen, amen. Anytime he's going to introduce a statement, when you see this amen word being used, obviously a Hebrew word, But it means that what is about to be said is trustworthy and true and dependable. And this hallelujah, again, attached to the hallelujah, means that what he is going to do by destroying evil, by destroying the system of Babylon, is for sure. It is a guarantee by putting these two words together, which you and I can trust, that the system we're under now will eventually be destroyed and we get praise for that. Notice this, though, that, he, that it says that they worship God who sat on the throne. This is an important point. In the Greek, the way it should be stated is that the one who sits continually on the throne is the way it's pictured. Now, what is it trying to get across? Is that during this period of time, not only in the tribulation, but even our time and time before, that God continues to sit on this throne. Well, what does that mean? He's sitting on the throne. It means this. It's a, it, he's literally doing it, but it, it, it sends a message. And the message is that God has the right to rule. That's what sovereignty means. It doesn't mean meticulous control. It means he has the right to rule, and he's going to flush this out. And two, by providence, he is bringing this to a head. He is allowing what you and I are seeing in this world, which is totally just scaring us. But he is allowing what you see in this world to happen, to bring this to this head. So this is why I'm so happy that Trump is opposing the globalists. But guys, if they take Trump out, or if he doesn't get the next election, then what's left? You will have somebody in office that wants to get hooked up with the globalists who will send America down the river as far as globalism, because that's what they want, and that's where it's heading. And if the rapture doesn't happen soon, you and I will watch that. We're only, we're only told we're going to be raptured prior to the tribulation, but we could see a lot of buildup, man. We could see a cashless society. We could see a one-world government where we lose national sovereignty, because that's what they want. But he says, I'm allowing this. I'm providentially allowing. I'm sitting on the throne And I know what I'm doing, and I'm letting this happen. Now we bring it to your life, real quick. 
I don't understand what's going on in your life. You do. You know all the stuff that's going on. And maybe you're saying, man, my life is chaotic. It's crazy. I don't know what's up and what's down anymore. There's so many goofy things happening to me. That passage is telling you God sits continually on the throne. He is providentially orchestrating everything in your life. Nothing comes into your life that doesn't come by his permission. And now, don't, don't get this wrong. He's not causing it. Do not make that mistake, because Satan will say he's causing it. He's not causing it. He has to permit it, or he allows it, because he's allowing freedom. He's allowing our freedom, everyone else's freedom. But yet he's in control. That's amazing that God is so powerful that he's in control and can let the free agents of humanity and fallen angels do what they want to do and yet still bring everything to a head. That's absolutely amazing, but that's God. So I don't know what's happening in your life, but you can rest in this. God is continually on his throne. He sees every aspect of what's going on with you and is going to bring it to a head and he's going to eventually give you good things. Good things. Verse 5, then a voice came from the throne saying, praise our God, all you his servants and those who fear him, both small and great, no matter what social class you're in, because the salvation is offered to all. So it's a command, a command to praise him. And I heard, as it were, the voice of a great multitude, a sound of many waters and a sound of mighty thundering saying, Hallelujah, for the Lord, or Yahweh, God, Elohim, omnipotent, El Shaddai, reigns. Now what is impact there is this, that obviously Yahweh is the personal name of God because he's the personal God. He's not a force out there. He is the personal God that attends to your life. He knows every aspect of you because he's personal. Elohim is a picture of, It's a name of God, but it's a generic name, but it signals his strength and power as creator. That he has the power to deliver you through all of this. And then El Shaddai has to do with the all-sufficient one who can make all provision for you because he has absolute power. He is nourishing and satisfying. So it's encapsulated, and these people are experiencing that. Because you know why? These people went through the hardest period of time in history, think about what they went through. First of all, they missed the rapture. Oh my land. And then you're stuck here with the Antichrist. You're left behind. So they have to contend with the whore of Babylon, the religious aspect. And if you don't contend with her, your head's chopped off. And then the Antichrist rises, and then then he's going to chop your head off if you don't worship him. So there's going to be a lot of tribulation saints that are just going through a living nightmare, or hell come on earth. And yet they're still praising God because he saw them through it. Now what you say, we well, saw them through it. They died. That's not the point. To God, death is not a problem for him because he has the power to raise people back from the, from the dead. So it, that, that physical death is not the worst thing that can happen to you. It's the second death that's the worst thing that can happen to you, where you're separated from God from all eternity in hell. So at the end of this, they're, they're in heaven. We're there. We, we've been raptured. We're there, and we're seeing all this. And they're praising God despite going through the worst period of time. That's hard to imagine to say, because we're seeing our, 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 what we're going through And you're like, man, I have my own personal hell that I'm going through right now. And it's really hard to praise God. That's what a lot of people, Christians, to be honest, will tell you. I'm having a hard time praising God because of the hell I'm going through right now. But what's happening is you're not seeing past the hell. You're not seeing past to see the goodness of God. He is doing good things. Think back in your history. Recount your history. If you've ever done this, this is important for you to do if you haven't, is you recount your history and you look at the goodness of God and what he has done for you. Some of you can, 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 can point out that I'm lucky to be alive. Some of you say, yeah, I would have been dead had he not intervened at some points in time in my life and rescued me. You're right. That's part of it. That's what we're going at. The jobs you have, the way you, your life went, 
He gave you the freedom to make decisions, but he, again, you can see his protection a lot of times in your life. That's the goodness of God. Now, we, we make a lot of bad mistakes, but isn't that amazing? Sometimes he cleans up our messes. He's willing to clean up our mess. Yeah, that's him. That's what they're praising him for. They see the goodness past the bad happening to them. It's a very mature position to be in, I'm going to tell you that. If you have immaturity in you, you won't get past the badness. It's just the way it works. You have to be mature to do this. Verse 7, let us be glad and rejoice and give him glory. For the marriage of the Lamb has come and his wife has made herself ready. And that's you and I. The marriage of the Lamb. Now, what I want to do with that, because the Scripture is lending itself to it, it's important now to understand since that terminology is being used of marriage of the lamb and the wife has made herself ready, and that's a reference to the church, you need to understand the Jewish concept of the Jewish wedding. That's the Hebraic understanding of things. And understand that the Jewish wedding is a schematic for prophecy. And a lot of people don't know this. So I inserted in your bulletin a handout for you. And if you want to reference that, you can. I'll have it on the screen. And I want to go through this, and I want you to see the beauty of how God orchestrates prophecy according to a Jewish wedding. Now, here's the deal. No other system of prophecy other than a dispensational, other than a futuristic, pre-trib, pre-millennial version of prophecy will fit a Jewish wedding. Preterism doesn't fit it. Postmillennialism doesn't fit it. Amillennialism doesn't fit it. No other system fits it. And yet, it's the biblical language Jesus and the writers of the New Testament will use in reference to prophecy. And I'm talking about futuristic prophecy, about the rapture, the second coming, and all that. So, with that in mind, I think it's important for us to go through this so we can understand where are we at in this text in a Jewish wedding? Where are we at? Okay, so if you have your handouts, you can just follow along. I'm going to quickly go through this, but you can have this as a handout. You can study it on your own. Okay, in a Jewish wedding, and we might, we'll have that on the screen, there's three groups involved. The first one, obviously, is the groom. He's called the bridegroom. Obviously, that's a reference to Jesus, right? He is the groom. You'll see that language, okay? He's the bridegroom. And then obviously there's the bride. That's a reference to the church. And then the other group that's there are called the guests. Guests are every believer outside of the church. To be in the church is to be in Christ. It's a very privileged position to be in, by the way. So you and I are very fortunate. A goodness has happened to us that a lot of people take for granted. So Old Testament saints, even tribulation saints, even John the Baptist, he said, I'm a friend of the bridegroom. He didn't say he was the bride. He said he was a friend. And even Moses would be a friend or whatnot. Okay, so the other guests are all believers outside of the church. Okay, so then if you move down, there's four aspects to a Jewish wedding to pinpoint where we're at in the book of Revelation. The wedding contract or what's called the ketubah. There has to be a contract made between the bride and the bridegroom and with their father, her father. And so the first thing is, you follow me on the outline, the first thing on letter A is the groom had to go to the residence of the bride to make a proposal. How did our groom come to the residence of the bride? Jesus came from above at the incarnation and became one of us. He came to our residence, planet Earth, right? You following how it goes? B, The groom and the father of the bride had to decide the terms of the covenant and the bride price, or what's called the mohar. What was our bride price? Blood. And that blood pointed to death. That part of the bride price is you're going to have to die for them. If you want them, you will have to die for them. You will have to shed your blood and die as an atonement for them. That's our bride price. Okay? In the ancient culture, you had to give the father a bride price for raising her because back then, very agrarian society, the boys were very much more valued simply because they could work on the farm better. That's simply how it was. 
but when you took a female, you had to give her a bride price, the, the parents a bride price. C, the groom proposes to the bride. And you can see all the passages in Scripture that I put down there of all the proposals that Jesus has made to people about being saved. Then you move into the bridal acceptance. If the bride accepts the proposal, and she did have a say in this, by the way, a cup of wine was shared to seal the marriage contract. At this point, the couple is as good as married. From this point on, they are betrothed. They haven't consummated the marriage. They're they're legally married. Again, you can see that with the wine being shared at the, with a marriage contract, that points to the Lord's Supper. We share in that wine, and we share in the wine of redemption, the third cup, because eventually we're going we're gonna to consummate and have what's called the second cup of wine. There's two cups of wine in a marriage. The first one is that the marriage proposal, the acceptance of it, you drink the wine, and then eventually at the, the marriage feast you drink a second wine. Now, This comes to the point where Jesus would say, you have to eat my flesh and drink my blood. What does he mean? You have to take into you and metabolize the truth that I'm telling you and make it part of you so you can be saved. You have to accept what I'm telling you into you. And that's the idea of the marriage contract and you accepting it. And we've all done that, symbolized by the drinking of wine. Then a wedding announcement is issued that the wedding is happening in the future. We'll see this in Revelation 9, okay? Now let's move to the betrothal period. The groom departs and starts to build a bridal chamber at his father's house. And this is, these are the exact words the, the groom will say. I go to prepare a place for you at my father's house. Where have you seen that before? You said Jesus said it to the disciples the night before he was crucified. You're right. So what you're saying is Messiah used the wedding language? Yes. And you start seeing this wedding language get picked up. That's exactly what a groom would say. I go to prepare a place for you. And what he would do is go back to his dad's house, and they would actually build on an extra room called a bridal chamber or chupa, and he would, he would, that would be the, the bridal chamber that was attached to the dad's house. Do you know what our bridal chamber is? It's the New Jerusalem. That's the bridal chamber. He's, he goes, I go to prepare a place for you. What's the p- p- place? It's the New Jerusalem. Okay, letter B. The bride took a mikvah to symbolize passing from the old to the new. Do you know what our mikvah is? It's baptism. Again, symbolizing a passing from the old to the new, right? Then the bride was given gifts. Have we been given gifts? Yes, it says in Ephesians that we've been given gifts. Most of us in here have multiple gifts. And the Holy Spirit is a gift. And then the bride is to prepare herself. She is to make herself look beautiful. That's what she's supposed to do in this betrothal period, is work on her appearance for the, for the wedding. And do you know how we make ourselves look good to Jesus? Becoming more like him. Sanctification. Responsibility and becoming like him. Makes ourselves more beautiful. Makes ourselves a beautiful bride to him. Go to the back page, number three. Now we go to the chupa, the wedding ceremony or what's called the wedding chamber. The father of the groom decides when the bridal chamber is ready. He would come out and expect what his son has built. And then if it was ready, he would say, go get your bride. This comes back to when Jesus in his humanity said, no one knows the day or the hour, not even the angels in heaven, nor the son of man, but only my father knows. He was using wedding language. In his deity, he knows, but in his humanity, he didn't. But what he was saying is using wedding language, saying the father's going to determine the time that I come back and get my bride. That's how it works. He has the authority. He's going to do it, just as in a Jewish wedding would happen. And then B, the groom fetches the bride without warning. This is why the bridesmaids with the girl had to have their lamps full of oil and trimmed and ready to go because he could come at any time in the night. And usually he came at midnight, the midnight hour. He would come and fetch her without warning. The only warning she would get is this. They would blow a shofar, and then they would say, the bridegroom is coming, the bridegroom is coming. And they would have to just, wherever they were, get up and get ready, get everything. They had to have everything packed. They were ready to go. And what are we supposed to be doing? We're always supposed to be ready, aren't we, whenever he's ready to call us home. Just like a bride. Okay, then he fetches her and he takes her to the chupa, 
the bridal chamber, the New Jerusalem, and then what would happen is the inspection would happen with her. And the inspection had to do with whether or not she was a virgin. And the idea is that the friend of the groom would stand outside the hoopah, they would have sex, and he would claim that she's a virgin. And they would have the cloth to prove it because of the blood on the cloth. And that's how a Jewish wedding went, that she was clean and virgin. Paul says, I, I want to present the church as a chaste virgin to the Messiah, he said it to the Corinth church. Now, the idea of the inspection then becomes known as what's called the Bema Seat of Christ, the Judgment Seat of Christ, when the, when the church stands before Jesus and he judges us individually, not on salvation, but for how beautiful we look. And unfortunately, some people are not beautifying themselves, not in a physical way, but a spiritual way, because they're not being conformed to the image of Christ. They're refusing to grow. They're refusing to do what he told them to do. And hence, they're going to have a tongue lashing at the bema seat of Christ for what they didn't do. They will lose rewards. But nonetheless, that's the inspection. The D, the bride and the groom are officially married at this stage. They remain seven days in the bridal chamber. How many years are we in heaven with Jesus? Seven. You see the connection? E, the bride is now ready for the marriage supper, which is a public thing, and she will wear her bridal gown for all to see. And that brings us to where we're at in the text. So all this has happened. We've been caught away. We've been raptured. We've been at the judgment seat of Christ. And it says, the wife has made herself ready. Jump to verse 8. And to her was granted to be arrayed in fine linen, clean and bright. And for the fine linen is the righteous acts of the saints. There's our wedding garments. It comes at the end of the seven-year hoopah. Or the seven-day hoopah, being in the bridal chamber, and now we've been judged, and God can now, the Messiah can now give our bridal clothes. And what, what does it say in the text? And this is extremely important. How is our wedding clothes going to look? What are they related to? The righteous acts of the saints. Not the righteousness of Christ, which has been given to us, imputed to us. It says the righteous acts of the saints. Oh, so you get to design your own wedding clothes? Yeah, you get to design your own wedding clothes. What do you mean? Your clothes will be dependent on how much the Messiah can reward you for. Some, it says will be ashamed at his coming because they have nothing to be rewarded for. Some will be heavily rewarded. Now, what does all this reward talk about? Well, it's your discipleship. It's your sanctification. It's your responsibility to cooperate with the Holy Spirit and yield to him and grow. It's not being worldly. It's being obedient. It's being, having doctrinal purity. It's having faithfulness to God and to Jesus. In his word and in your actions. It's your behavior. It's your growth. It's your maturity. It's how you influence others for righteousness. It's how you evangelize. It's all those things. But here's what it's not. You will not be rewarded for doing your duty. Luke 17, 7 through 10 confirms this. Doing your duty does not get you rewards. I hate to break it to you. It is your duty to come to church. It is your duty to pray. It is your duty to read the Bible. It is your duty to evangelize. It is your duty to serve. So what are we rewarded on then? You're only rewarded if you go the second mile beyond duty, which requires some sacrifice on your part, some sacrifice of time, sacrifice of worldly advantage, some sacrifice of money, some sacrifice of whatever it takes. You will have to give up your life to have the abundant life. If you want to be rewarded in the next life, you're going to have to let go of this world. You're going to have to stop trying to get worldly advantages. Because if you do, you will be rewarded here. 
You'll get your praise here. But in the next world, you won't have wedding garments. And I'm just being as straight up with you as I possibly can because I'm not trying to scare you. But most Christians don't understand this concept because they've never been taught. They think, as long as I get my fire insurance with Jesus, I'm good. And I can just put the oars in the boat and I'm fine. We're not talking about salvation. Salvation is a done deal if you've accepted the Messiah. We're talking about discipleship, sanctification, which is a big deal in the, in the New Testament. I'll leave you with this. And I told my class this morning, some Christians have faith that's alive, and some Christians have a faith that's dead. James talks about this in chapter 2, and he's not talking about salvation. He says faith without works is dead. Faith without works is dead. Now, it's not talking about the, that your works evidence your salvation. That, that, that's a Calvinistic interpretation, and I don't like that. What he's talking, he's talking to believers. He's not saying that, they, that their works make them doubt their salvation, even though there is a category of people who are faking it. I get that. He's talking about if your life doesn't evidence a sanctification life, becoming more like Christ, doing service, doing good works for, the, for, for Jesus, he says, then you have a dead faith. You're saved, but what it, what it means to have a dead faith is that your, your spiritual walk with the Lord is not producing what it's supposed to produce. And that's on you. That's on me if it doesn't do that. I can't blame anyone else if my faith doesn't produce anything in my life. What it does is it brings the responsibility back on us. That we're not victims. That we're choosing to do certain things that prevent us from being rewarded. And my thing as a pastor is, I want you to be rewarded. I don't want you to waste your life. I want God to say, well done, good and faithful servant. You want to hear that too. But you have to step up. You can't sit on the sidelines. You can't just sit back and watch things unfold before you. You have to step up at some point in your life. And if you are right now, God bless you. Keep doing it. But if you're not, then ask yourself, what is my faith producing in my life? And he says this, verse 9, and and then he says, and he said to me, right, blessed are those who are called to the marriage supper of the Lamb. So all everyone's called, and and, and those who who receive that invitation to go there. And that becomes the fourth aspect of the, the Jewish wedding. And on your handout, real quick, I'll just go over it. It's the second cup of wine, the ketubah, the halal cup, the cup of praise. That will happen at the marriage supper of the Lamb on earth, on planet earth, when that happens. It's the wedding feast for the church, and it's also the wedding feast of Israel, who has now remarried Yahweh. So it's a kind of a, a, a twofold feast there. One for the church, one for Israel, all there together. But it's the second cup. In the Passover, it's called the 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 cup of praise, or what does praise mean in Hebrew? Hallel, the Hallel cup. And you finally take that last cup and you seal the deal. And we go into the millennial reign of Christ. And then he follows it up and he says, and he said to me, these are the true sayings of God. Basically, everything he has said is going to happen. He's coming to right all the wrongs. He's coming to make it all better. He's coming to fix things, to bring the bubble back into circle, to where it needs to be. But unfortunately, what's happening is a lot of Christians are getting distracted by the bad things happening to them. And a lot of Christians are stuck with what happened to their past. They're discouraged and disappointed in life and disillusioned with life. And the devil wants you there, man. He wants you to be bitter He wants you to be angry about what's happened to you. He wants you to focus in, hey man, you prayed for healing and it never came. You asked for things from God and they never came. People burned you in life. How come God didn't save you? He must be unsafe. If he really cared about you, he would have brought the right person to you and not keep bringing these degenerates to you that you hook up with. Why doesn't he help you? 
How come he doesn't bring your adult child that has went prodigal on you back to you? He must not love your child. He must not love you. You see how it works? And so we don't start thinking that time with God is beneficial to us. If we think he's not good, you will want to spend less time with him. Hence, if you, if you say, well, I'm struggling to, to read the Bible, it's hard to get into it. it. Maybe it's not your struggle of reading it, it's your struggle with you have a wedge that Satan has put between you and God, and you just don't think you benefit from God. That you don't get anything good from him. And that's why people distance themselves, even Christians. But yet James says this, every good gift and perfect gift is from above that comes down from the Father of lights. Those bad things happening to you are not coming from God. They're coming from the world, Satan, ourselves, and other people. They're not coming from God. He only gives good gifts. Only good gifts. But be careful. If you take Satan's bait, you'll get bittered up with God. You'll get bittered up with reality. And here's the deal. The minute you do that, life stops working. You lose faith. You start doubting. And your attitude towards God, Christianity, and your walk changes. You say, well, is there a lot of twisted sisters and bitter brothers? Oh, man, there's a lot of them, man. And it's because they keep seeing the bad in their life. And they never see the good of God. Never. And they're trapped. That's exactly where Saint wanted them. Let me share you a story, and we'll end on this. I was listening to a podcast this week about a couple who um, obviously got saved, but they had been involved in the occult for a very long time. I mean, pretty deep. Got into New Age spiritism, crystals, Reiki healing, and all kinds of occultic practices, and just as bad as bad as you can get because they started having, they called them spirit guides, and these spirit guides would come help them and, and do different things. And this is interesting what they said in their testimony is that the one gal was in a a very bad relationship with probably a demon-possessed dude, and he was really mean to her and bad to her and and beat her and did all kinds of crazy stuff to her, and yet she kept coming back to him because she gave him drugs and, and she was addicted to drugs and alcohol, and he just kept feeding her this even though he was mean and nasty to her. A lot of demonic activity going on there. But this is interesting Then came along another guy in her life who was involved in the New Age, occultism, and says, I can heal you of your addictions. So all this bad stuff that you're doing that's there, I can do a Reiki healing on you and get you past it. Well, he did. And she lost her addictions She was sick for like three days, but when she came out of it, she says, I didn't have a a, a will to smoke. I didn't have a will to do drugs. I didn't have a will to drink alcohol anymore. I was totally healed from my addictions. And through the whole process, in New Age, they make God the enemy. So don't mistake that, that, that how deep she was involved, that Satan is the hero in that world, and God is the enemy. Jesus is the enemy. And she never saw anything that, that good coming from God. She only saw good coming from her Reiki master who got her off of addictions and whatnot. And it's a false good because she jumped out of the frying pan and went into the fire because the Reiki guy was full of demons and brought a lot of demons into her life and she was about as twisted up in the occult as you can possibly imagine. Bad real bad, to where she said, yeah, it was good at the beginning, and then the demon started oppressing her hardcore, man. I mean, just coming down on her and terrorizing her, doing all kinds of things, so she went from bad to worse. She never saw the goodness of God, never, and neither did this guy she was with. And so she continues to tell her story, and she says, then, then God did something. He showed me his goodness. And she says, the way he showed me his goodness is that he reached down to where we were at and got my attention and my husband's attention. And she explained how he did this. And he, God, we call it in theological terms a power encounter. 
where someone's so deep in the, the occult, it's hard to get them out of it, man. And, and it takes God coming in and intervening into through all that demonic activity and breaking through all of that to get to them. And she said that uh, heavily involved in the occult, obviously, and then so God started reaching out to them. The first thing that happened to her that they saw the goodness of God is that her husband woke up from a night's sleep and kept yelling, the bridegroom is coming, the bridegroom is coming, the bridegroom is coming. And it woke her up, and she says, what's wrong with you? And he goes, oh, never mind, never mind, never mind. And he would have this dream, the bridegroom is coming, the bridegroom is coming, the bridegroom is coming. And, you know, finally they said, well, what's going on? And he says, the Christians are right. I was given a dream from God that Jesus is coming back and I'm not ready. And he's coming back to destroy evil. He's coming back to destroy the very demons that are attacking us. We're not worshiping God, we're worshiping demons. And I saw the one true God. It's Jesus. Jesus is God. He's the good one. He's not, the Satan's not the good one. He's the good one. And they, right there, accepted Jesus as Lord and Savior. From what? From the very passage you and I are reading. That the bridegroom is coming. Praise God. Hallelujah. What does that mean? It means that God is coming back to destroy evil, and that is a good thing. They saw the goodness in him coming back with the very words you and I are studying. The bridegroom is coming. Wow. If an occultist can see the goodness in that phrase being told to them in a dream, how much more for you and I?